most of you, since you are interested in history, have done research with archival materials. Is that true? Everybody, pretty much? Okay, good. Because I didn't want to have to kind of explain basic stuff. I'm going to just jump right in then. Um, at the end of the talk, I will talk briefly about how to access collections at Southern. <coughs> But this evening, I'll mostly provide information on the founding of our special collections, as well as some of the strengths of our collections, <coughs> some of the activities that we are doing associated with the collections, and some of our new acquisitions, um, as well as highlights for the bicentennial year, because we have been doing activities for that. And, um, so let's just go ahead and get started because I know I'm going to run a little a little over. These are the areas that we really collect in. Our rare books, Mississippiana, the DeGrummond Children's Literature Collection, Historical Manuscripts, and University Archives. Now, in 1976, Southern built a special collections library. Up until that time, all the special collections had been the main Cook Library, and they named it after William McCain, who was the fifth president at Southern, and he had been the state archivist prior to that. And at the time that we moved in there, we already had a lot of, like, the nascent collections. We had the DeGromian collection. We had some rare books, we had a few historical manuscripts, some uh, university archives, as well as Mississippiana. So in this building, there's actually four levels, although it's not obvious from the outside. Um, and it's about a 40,000 square foot building we shared with the graduate school, and we take up about 24,000 square feet between our collections and our reading rooms. Um, now, Rare Books were the first collection to come in, and that was in 1952. It was uh, donated by Sam E. Woods. Um, along with the Rare Books, we got some furniture, prints, and paintings, which, as you know, if you're familiar with special collections, is something that does happen often. Um, we, and there's about 1,100 of these rare books in this collection. This one is actually a rare copy of John Calvin's commentaries on St. Paul's letters. And I don't know if you can see it that well, but it's a, this beautiful cover with metal binding. Now, in 2011, Southern redid the Sam E. Woods room which is part of special collections. This is all one room, but one is the north side and one is the south side. So we use this side really for educational purposes and here we use for exhibition and sort of more kind of entertaining. Um, now, and Woods was a really interesting character and I'm gonna talk about a few really interesting characters tonight because that's the part that I really love about my job. Um, you know, these materials really, you get to where you feel like you know the people. And um, <laughs> Woods, he was born in Texas, but he moved early to Mississippi. He graduated from Purvis High School. He did a really, just a two-year stint at University of Southern Mississippi. He headed the Department of Manual Arts. Then he goes off in World War One. He's with the Aviation Division in with the Marine Corps. And when the war ends, he stays in Czechoslovakia and he works as a civilian, sometimes for the government, and really just kind of, you know, more or less stays in Europe until World War II. So he's a, an attache in Berlin in 1940, and he ends up spying for the U.S. government. And he is the one that gets the news that Germany is going to invade Russia. So then they're able to warn Stalin, who just refuses to believe it. Um, but he found out the whole way, so. Um, so then in 41, when the U.S. enters the war, uh, Woods and some journalists and others were interred for about 
five years, they were fortunate, I mean five months, they were fortunate to be released and allowed to go to Switzerland, and he stayed there. And he ends up dying in, in the 50s, so that was getting kind of towards the end of his life. And then um, we have the Dubrumman Children's Literature Collection, and this is a very popular collection that we have. And it was founded by Lena de Grumman, who came to USM in 66. And unlike Woods, she stuck around, and she had a real vision. She came to teach children's literature in our School of Library Science. And she just decided from the very beginning that she didn't want to teach just from children's published books. She wanted the primary sources, people's manuscripts, their, the proofs that they sent off, the illustrations, the sketches, the whole nine yards. And she decides that she's just going to write these children's authors. And some of them were already, you know, pretty reputable authors. And, you know, kind of incredibly, they respond very positively to her. And so immediately she gets two, a couple, Bertha and Elma Hatter, to, who were Caldecott winners, to give her all their archival materials. And then it was followed by Lois Linsky, who you um, may remember, like the little airplane, and that whole series. She donated those. And then most notably were H.A. and Margaret Ray, who created Curious George. And that collection for us gets an incredible amount of attention. In fact, we had Curious George down for the bicentennial on the Bicentennial Plaza. And right now, we're preparing some materials to go on a traveling exhibition in Japan for a couple of years. So there's just uh, so much love for Curious George. And it's, um, it's interesting because the Rays also have this really fabulous story, and they were both of German-Jewish descent. They were living in Paris. As the Nazis were marching in, they got on bicycles. They had the Curious George manuscript in their backpacks, and they biked out of Paris, and then into Portugal, and were able to get to Brazil. <laughs> um, so, that, so we can get people, too, that are interested in the Rays. And we collect British literature as well as American for that. Now, the, um, the politician papers are always important for us. And we got them very early on. These were two that came in prior to the building of McCain. Um, and I'm not going to go a lot because I think, you know, I'm not from the city. I suspect you know a lot more about Bilbo and Colmer than I do, um, but we were fortunate, and you can see how large that collection is. I mean, it's almost 700 <coughs> linear feet, and that came in, as I said, before the 76. And um, and I think you all realize he, he was with the, the Senate for a long time. He was the you know, senator. And um, then we have Colmer, who grew up right around here. He was born in Pascagoula, went through Gulfport Public Schools. And he, um, his papers document all the years that he was in Congress. And at the time that he died in 73, <coughs> he actually had served longer than any other Mississippian in Congress. Now, university archives, <coughs> I'm not really going to talk a lot about these because this is the only area that we actually restrict. Um, most, like, you know, anyone from the public can walk into our reading room and request, and usually, unless the donor has put restrictions, they are allowed to see the material. It's a little more complicated for university archives. Um, and you have to actually go and get permission from the head of the department. <coughs> so I'm not really going to go very much into that. I will say that, the, that Southern has started a records management program. We work with the Mississippi Department of Archives and History 
to get all of our retention schedules uh, approved. So we're up in Jackson for the Records uh, Commission meetings four times a year. And this is one of my staff members who does the bulk of that work. Okay, and then I'm going to talk about strengths and activities of collection because often that goes hand in hand. If it's an area where we're collecting a lot, we tend to want to have an activity associated with it, meaning the curators. So we may have a reception, we may have a lecture, we may publish, we may do an exhibition. So that's why I'm, I'm kind of covering these two things together. As I said, um, pol politicians' papers are always important for us. Um, other collecting areas are the Civil War and Civil, uh, civil Rights, because Mississippi was so integral to, to those historic events. Um, and also early industries like lumber and railroad. And here we have, I've actually published this with Southern Quarterly, and it's from Evelyn Gandy. And that's just one way, like, we, you know, it's just an example of, of getting word out. And for this, it was about um, a high school essay that I had found in her papers. It's only like four pages. But in it, she really expressed, like, all these beliefs that you then see the rest of her career, like she stayed so consistent. It was amazing. So that, that became the topic. And right now we have Jean Taylor papers that we um, are in the middle of processing. Those weren't quite available. And then we have uh, one of the justices, Rogers, papers that just <coughs> came in. And we were fortunate because they were in a shed on family property that was then turned over. So we were like really lucky that we were not forever lost. One activity we did this year that was a lot of fun, we had the Dixie Darling homecoming reception. They came during our homecoming week. And as a result, which is what often happens, we got like more gifts, including, and I, you can't really see well here, but Freddie Taylor, this woman, wore this uh, uniform like in the 50s. She was a Dixie Darling, and she let us have her uniform, so we're very grateful for that. Um, now, under curator Jennifer Brannick, who is the curator of Rare Books in Mississippi, um, those collections have developed in some new and really innovative ways. She likes to collect pulp fiction, <laughs> which she's kind of exhausted all of this to be pulp, pulp fiction, and has moved on to paranormal. And so one of our students, um, and apparently Pascagoula, we have like a she, collect, she collects the UFO. Oh, yeah. oh yes. Pascagoula UFO. Anything we can, I sent her some newspaper clips, copies. See, she gets home from all over. <laughs> I had those from way back in 73. Thank you, Alice. <laughs> so one of our seniors, he won a contest. We have like three cases in the library, so three students you know, competed and he got a case and he decided to do Legends in Folklore of Mississippi and the Gulf Coast. And we're fortunate he's actually staying on as a graduate student. So he'll be with us later. Um, now, yeah, Jennifer also has built a comprehensive collection of Mississippi community cookbooks. And she collaborates with one of our history professors, Andrew Haley, and you can see his very first book here, Turning the Tables, published in 2012, and it wins like a James Beard Award. Um, and I just recently heard, they give joint talks a lot, and I, I just recently heard them for the first time, and it was like fascinating to see how much like information you can learn about a community from the cookbooks that they produce over the years. And I brought some recipe cards for you all. You're welcome to, to choose one um, and take it home with you. And I will tell you, our cookbook is in your collection. <laughs> the oh, well, that cookbook. makes sense. Mm -hmm. That yeah. makes sense. <laughs> <laughs> Yes, 
Now, each year, Jennifer organizes two events around this collection. And in the fall, it's a potluck reception for one of Do Dr. Haley's uh, lectures. And there, like the rule is, if you want to bring food, that's fine, but you have to use a historic recipe. There's like no cheating. Some of these are better than others. <laughs> you know, taking, taking your chances. Andrew always says, you think your grandparents cooked better than you did but maybe not. And, um, and then in the spring, there's the Edible Book Festival, which is it's really fun. Contestants base their culinary creations on book titles. And this is actually winter. It's, it's really more about being creative and wordplay than it is about cooking, because these are Lay's potato chips for Lay's and the So it was very cute, and, and people voted for it. Now, to get back to de Grumman, which is headed by our curator, Ellen Ruffin. Um, de Grumman is the sole repository for the Ezra Jack Keats archive, and it has an ongoing relationship with the Keats Foundation up in New York. And Keats, if you're not familiar with him, he authored and or illustrated 37 books in his lifetime. And he received the 63 Caldecott Award for his most famous book, Snowy Day, which um, they animated recently, and it just received, we just got news, that it received two Emmys. So mm -hmm. the people up in New York and us are very excited. And the archive <coughs> includes manuscripts, proofs, illustrations, and his personal papers. Each year in April, the uh, Southern hosts the Kegler Children's Book Festival, where these awards are presented, one for a new author and one for a new illustrator every year. And that just concluded, and if you're interested in children's literature at all, I would recommend going. This was my first year going and I loved it. Um, now, this year, as we have in the past, DeGrumman has worked with the foundation to bring an exhibition from the Norman Rockwell Museum to Hattiesburg. As to the gallery, it's called the Fellows Gallery in downtown Hattiesburg. And this one is Wendell Minor, who has illustrated books by Fanny Flagg, by Nathaniel Philbrick, and by Buzz Aldrin. Um, and unfortunately, it's only up until like through Saturday. So you only have a really small uh, window of time if you're interested in seeing. But I'll, I'll, you know, if you're at all interested in that type of thing, I would go, because it's beautifully installed in some really nice works. Oops, I went the wrong way. Okay, now I'm going to talk about <coughs> new acquisitions, things, um, and we, we get, you know, a, some really nice things, but I wanted to focus on the things that have been most meaningful since I have come in. Um, and I wanted to begin with the, the Chris Wilson Freedom Summer Collection, which is a, a pretty small collection, and I got to, but it has to do like with voting, uh, registration, doing civil rights, and I, I had this snippet from a report. This is only like, uh, this is well, this is a whole page, letter size page, and the back side too, of everything that has happened in all these small towns in Mississippi, is like resisting the voter registration in just like 24 hours. It was crazy. Like, so it really gives you a sense of like, you know, how tense things were. Um, and that was the first deed of gift I got to sign. I signed it like the third day I was at Southern. Ugh, did it again, sorry. And then we have the Cherry Burns paper, and I'm very happy to say that the woman who gave us um, the Cherry Burns paper is right here, her niece, Reem Serpa, wave and say hi, and her husband, Rich. And um, this collection I got a call about in October from Deanne Neuer, who is the Associate <coughs> Dean of Arts and Letters at our Gulf Coast campus. She was really excited about this collection, so I, I came down, I met with Rini and Rich, and they had brought some materials, which they did tonight, too, and I'm going I'm to pass, she's allowing me to pass these around, so I will do that. 
and um, and Cherry was another like super interesting person. She, at the age of 19, she joins the Denver Press. She was the, the youngest woman to ever join the Denver Press. Then she goes on, she works with the United Press and the International News Service. Then she ends up in Germany during the Marshall Plan years. And she loves not just an old typewriter, and I think you remember like how heavy those things were. <laughs> that and her sewing machine. <laughs> she made, I, I guess she figured there was not going to be a lot of, of uh, clothing chopping in Germany at the time. And she made this beautiful slip that we all admire. And it doesn't really do, um, do justice. We now have that in special collections. So, and we all really secretly want it. But we have to leave it in special collection. Um, so then she comes back from Germany. She, she ends up at working at Sandia Lab Corps, so we have information about like the atomic energy being developed and weaponry, um, because she was in their press. She was doing the presses. What years was that? Was she at Sandia? She stayed at Sandia a long time, from 56 to 73. And um, then she, it, later in life, in 73, she decides she's going to travel again. So she goes on this extensive um, trip and she ends up seeing 60 countries in South America, Africa, and Asia. And she also, she would die, and what makes it such a fantastic collection is that she documented everything. She kept extensive diary entries, she wrote people, and she, she did a lot of photography. Do you want to add anything? Well, we, we ended up with, uh, when Cherry died, she gave me everything. And I ended up with 4,000 slides that were used by the Associated Press. And then, of course, the IP. She was in the State Department for years when they settled back yeah. Germany. And so all these pictures were in Germany being resettled. And uh, then she had 2,000 black and whites. And she had the... Are they manuscripts? Is that what they are? Uh, what she typed and the way she typed mm -hmm. was from the college, the universities, where you would take the information, type it on your typewriter, have a carbon copy, the original went into this sleeve, and it was there. And then she had all the backup, every piece of backup that any person that she interviewed, everything is all there. All of her notes are there. There must be, a, what, a million words we can do, you know? Yeah. And then she wrote two, uh, well, actually three manuscripts. So I thought, I, I believe somebody's got to be inspired by this. And she, see that slip? There's a dress behind it, and it's a uh, lace dress. And the girl that came from the college to pick it up, she goes, oh, it's a size eight. She says, I could wear this. <laughs> you know that. She would uh -huh. wear it right away. You know, she was so impactful. But, they but had to go to the right. State Department <laughs> functions and they had to be dressed because they were being introduced and they were being sent with all these photos back over to us. And she was working with the Corps that were making those clips that were about 45 minutes long that were before movies, films. And yes. Uh, uh -huh. film. Okay, for resettlement of Germany. But the problem was is she had to have like an address each, each time that she got to these. So her mother would send them the fabric the fresh French fabric, she would send from Denver, from one of the big department um, stores. Then she would send it to Europe, and then they would get the little itty bitty sewing machine out, which was a singer this big, <laughs> and then she would sew her dresses. And I mean, she sewed everything. And she made all of her coats, the winter coats, they were beautiful, because they had nothing to do. <coughs> and then when she traveled, she went 60 some. Um, countries, remember? Yeah. Uh, mm -hmm. It took her almost two years, mm -hmm. and she wrote a book on how to travel without mm -hmm. living in an apartment or a house. Mm -hmm. How you could live cheaper traveling than you could. <laughs> <laughs> so be inspired. So be inspired. It's a fabulous collection. And then she spent, what, two years in South Africa during Mandela's time, uh, down in Cape Town. And she lived in Cape Town. And so it was real interesting. Mm -hmm. Great, great lady. Thank you. Okay. And let's see. 
Oh, this is a recent one from one of our professors. And um, these are antebellum letters. And as you can imagine, when you get back as far as the Civil War and earlier, you don't get like a whole collection in. And usually it's just a letter or two. So we were lucky enough that he purchased these for us. And this is an 1860 letter. It's written by someone who's dealing in slaves in Brookhaven. And he's in, we can tell from the transcript, that he is hiding the fact that there has been a case of measles. And so the whole thing is just kind of, you know. But we're, we're very lucky to have that. And also to have this wonderful one of the scrapbook. And we also have the donor of the scrapbook here, too. We have Mr. Rich, Richard Eckhart and his wife, Liz, with us. Thank you all for coming. And this is um, also really fascinating. It, it covers primarily the Meuse-Argonne offensive, which, as you may know, in World War I, that was the last big push. And that it, these positions along the Meuse-Argonne line, they had been held, a lot of them, from the time the war started, and there had been like no progress. And in September, they just decided, you know, we have to do it. And by November, it was over, and the armistice was signed November 11. And so um, Richard's uncle, Jack, is what he's called, Jack Eckert, who's pictured here, he also would, was a good documenter. And he kept, you know, these things ended up in a notebook. He had like a lot of like annotated maps, so you can look at them and you know like where the landmines are and everything. And of course, we have the Dale Center up at USM that deals with military history, so I've let them know that we we have this. And um, and I guess I guess I better move on. But but this, you know, I, I want to figure out a way to make this available. We're probably going to do it more digitally. Some of the maps are fragile when you undo them, so we're just kind of trying to figure out the best way to get them shot. But they, it's really, it's really a treasure for people that are studying military history. Keep doing that. Okay. Ugh. <coughs> Here we go. Okay, and we have been doing bicentennial activities. I was lucky enough to get a grant from the Mississippi Humanities Council. The poster on the right up here, which I don't know how well you can really see it anyway, but um, those are all the events that we've already held. We had a lecture on slavery. Um, we had one on an artist, Kate Freeman Clark, one on Mississippi's first newspaper. Upcoming events include lectures on Mississippi film industry by somebody at the Film Commission. She's coming down when there's that festival in Hattiesburg. So she's going to be talking June 7th. There's a festival that it's kind of like uh, South by Southwest, the answer to South by Southwest, I guess. And um, so she'll be down. And then we're going to have a lecture on Camp Shelby's a cent, uh, centennial, which corresponds with the Mississippi Bicentennial. Um, and we're going to have Margaret McMullen, who is a children's author. And she's, she uses Mississippi almost like a character in her novels. And so she's going to be coming up and speaking. And with Camp Shelby, what we hope to do is have um, a, like a library exhibition that has to do with um, World War One to kind of tie into all of that because we, we did find that that worked well and I'll talk about that in a second. And then we conclude the, uh, the Bicentennial with a lecture on civil rights in November. Sorry, I'll get it straight to the <coughs> right um, Now our most successful event to date, if I do say, if I, I, maybe I'm, you know, reading into it because this was actually my event, but <laughs> it was a, a criminal justice forum. And that concluded like this month-long exhibition that we had in Cook Library on the Mississippi State Penitentiary. And you know, kind of coming into Mississippi, I, I had never even heard of parchment. 
And people would say parchment, and they would say it like in such a way, I was like, and I thought it was just a town. And then I found out, oh no, it's the, the state penitentiary. And there seemed to be a lot of lore about it. And so I ended up looking into it, decided to do this exhibition. And it was unbelievable, the reaction we got to it. Because, you know, there's a musical component, like the Loman brothers came down, or Lomax brother, brothers came down and did recordings for the Library of Congress there. Um, a lot of artists used parchment. And it was just this fascinating history. So anyway, so when it concluded, we decided we were going to have kind of like, you know, after parchment uh, in 73, kind of like after it became just a more like a regular state penitentiary, um, and talk about that. So we had Willie Simmons down and a couple of other people from Department of Corrections and then someone who had written a book and done photography um, out of Delta State. And unbeknownst to us, we also had Felicia Hall, who just that day or that week had been announced as the new head of Department of Congre uh, Corrections. And she walks in with her entire entourage. And it was, even though it was like pouring <coughs> down rain all day. So it was really, it was, it was a lot of fun. It was really interesting. And um, who knows, maybe we'll, we'll get to do something similar later. All right, now I'm going to kind of give a few words about how you access our materials. And I'm just going to go through this quickly. Um, we have come up with some research guides, our, our curatorial staff, so that it's kind of everything in a nutshell. And I don't think you can really see from here, but if you, if you play around on our website, you'll be able to find it. So this is just kind of listing the research guides that are available, and they're kind of the main subjects that we collect in, genealogy, children's literature, civil rights, and so forth. Um, this I selected is the history of Hattiesburg. And then when you click on that, you can get to like a list. Somebody has compiled, compiled all of this for you. So it's listed books about. Hattiesburg, articles, primary sources, which is what we're dealing with today, digital material, and uh, vertical files, as well as reliable internet sources. So if we then select the uh, Hattiesburg Municipal Records, it brings us to the finding aid for that. And the finding aids is, I think you know because you have done research, but they all contain a biographical history which provides contextual information like who created these records or what organization created them and what were they doing, um, what do those records document and, and when. And then you get to the scope and content and that really tells you what's in the records. Are these diaries, are they ledgers, correspondence, or so forth. And then you have at the end a folder list. And that, to me, is always like the best thing to search <laughs> because it's the, it, the title of every single folder in the whole collection. So if you're interested in a correspondence, you know, you can just search and, and find the exact folder. Um, and finding aids can also be browsed directly under broad subject headings with kind of just lump them together, like the railroad collection. Or they can be searched. I might have gotten ahead of myself. Oh, no, I'm hearing you, you can search them from the main page, which is the easiest way, and that's really the way we do it the most. Uh, and so if we just put in Hattiesburg, we get these results. And when you do get the results, it's kind of a mix if you do it this way. So you have to look for finding aid in that path that you get. You can also use the main page to search um, for, for clip the vertical files. And here I typed in genealogy. These are the results. So you can see that we have genealogical files by every county in Mississippi. 
and these contain biographical information, family trees, uh, newspaper clippings, correspondence, and other material that might be helpful. I assume we have genealogists in the room. Everybody's a genealogist. <laughs> I'm, I'm, I'm going to be the next one. How much is that? I'm sorry? How much is that? Is that now? Not a lot. Not a lot. Not a lot. Yeah, Which I will. That was a good point. You can, again, there are a few of us in here who don't know, haven't done a lot of research. So what, defining what, when we go on the computer, that's just telling us what you have. And then we can go to it and find it. Right. Yes, exactly. It's, the, it's finding what's in paper form. And, and, and we do have some things that have been digitized or in, like you can go to our main site and go to digital collections. Um, but it's a fraction of what we have. And, you know, we're adding to it all the time, but um, it's, you know, by no means anywhere close to comprehensive for what we have. Um, but still, you know, it's nice to look at and see what you can find because they're all good things in it. And we kind of have it also broken down. We have um, civil rights is actually up here because that was the pilot project when they did the civil rights um, digitization project. And then we have the others down here, the Southernness uh, editorial cartoons, DeGrom, etc. Here's an example of Aesop's fables where, and this happens with DeGrom, and they'll go ahead and they'll do the entire book. So you can see like all the pages on the side. So that's something that is kind of comprehensive, but our records really are not. It's just maybe one letter. We don't do like a whole, a whole manuscript collection. And if you're using that, you can also do an advanced search and select which digital collections you want to search so you're not pulling up a lot of false hits. Ditto with the library catalog. You know, you, you can restrict that as well. Or you can just contact the curators. <laughs> a lot of people do. 